Hey everyone, I'm Jean-Paul and with this video I'm starting a mini-series of tutorials for Video Sync, which is one of the best solutions for playing back videos in Ableton Live Session View while doing a live performance. Video Sync itself is an app that communicates with Live through Max for Live, and despite it being a separate app, you can control almost everything in Live, so you don't need to switch back and forth between applications, which makes the workflow really smooth. Video Sync is being developed by a small company here in Amsterdam called ShowSync, and they specialize in creating software that allows for perfect synchronization of audio, video, and lighting, particularly in combination with Max for Live and Ableton Live. One of the early adapters and customers of Video Sync that you may have seen is John Gooch, aka FeedMe, who is now on his second tour with this awesome stage using Ableton Live, Video Sync, and LightSync. If you want to know more about ShowSync and what they do, be sure to check out their website. There is a link to it in the description below. In the first video, I want to show you how easy it is to use Video Sync with Ableton Live, but to start things off, let's take a quick look at some of the features and what we're gonna be looking at in this and future videos. First of all, we can use clip slots of audio channels to play back videos. Just hit the play button and the video will play back on the screen. The clips are, like audio, automatically warped and synced to the musical timeline. There are nine video effects which allow you to control and manipulate video in conjunction with audio. Then there's the video instruments like squares and simpler for video. And lastly, we have siphon in and outputs. All these devices integrate with Live's workflow and signal flow. But before I can show you how that works, let's look at how to install Video Sync and make it work with Ableton Live. I already downloaded the installer from the ShowSync website, and once we open it, we have to drag the app into the Applications folder. Once that's done, we can open Video Sync. And once we do that, we can see at the top of Video Sync's window that it still isn't connected to Live, so let's start up Live. As soon as we hit the launcher, Video Sync recognizes Live and wants to install its control surface. This is essential for Video Sync to be able to communicate with Live, so hit continue, restart Live as prompted, and then as the video on screen shows, we should now select Video Sync's control surface in the link slash MIDI preferences in Live. Once you've done this, the installer tells us we're done and Video Sync will now show that it is indeed connected to live. In order for me to be flexible while editing this video, I had to record both live and Video Sync's windows on separate screens. I could have used one system with an external monitor for the Video Sync window, which normally would be visible to the audience, but since not every computer is powerful enough to handle both audio and video processing at the same time, especially when running a large live set while on stage, I like to show you how to use two systems so you can spread that workload. This is of course entirely optional, but I'd like to show you anyway since I had to do it in order to make this video. Currently Video Sync is only installed on my MacBook. It'd be great though if it could run on my iMac instead so that my MacBook only has to take care of the audio part of our live set. This is actually really easy to do. First, let's start with repeating the same installation process for Video Sync. Installing live in the control surface is not required, unless you want to be able to run and test things locally sometimes. But for this video, I'm closing live and will only be running Video Sync on my iMac. The next thing we should do is connect both devices to each other with an Ethernet cable. It would also work on Wi Fi, however, wireless signals are less dependable than cables, so let's just go with the safer option here. Then, open the network preferences on the machine that runs Ableton Live, in this case, my MacBook. Select Ethernet on the left, and then take note of the IP address that is now shown on screen. On the machine that runs Video Sync, go to the app's preferences, then the I.O. tab, click the checkbox, and fill in the IP address we just discovered. The iMac will now work as the video monitor, whereas the MacBook will host our live set. One extra important step is about the video material that we are going to use. As only control signals are transmitted over the Ethernet cable and not the video files themselves, 
we'll have to place all the videos we use in our live set on both the systems. I therefore recommend placing the videos in a Cloud Sync folder so that the folder location on both machines is identical and it automatically updates itself. Once that's done, all we have to do is tell Video Sync in the same I.O. tab as before where the video files are located. So, now that we're all set, let's close all the windows, full screen Video Sync, and let's go from there. Okay, so let's grab this clip right here, which is called OK as well, ironically, and hit play. Now sadly, there isn't a way to preview video clips yet in Live's browser, so you have to do that in the Finder, and hopefully we'll get some kind of previewer in the future. Now, if we want to change the opacity of this particular clip, we'll have to lower the volume on this channel. So the volume fader controls the opacity as well as volume. Only the opacity stops at zero, so that's the max opacity. If you go over that, then it only applies to audio. And since video clips can also contain audio, including this one, only this one has been saved with the clip volume set to silence. However, if we open that, we can get some sweet music. And if we want to change the length of this clip in particular, we can just change the loop markers here. So now it's a one bar loop. So the video clip will loop just for one bar, but if we want to use a different part of the video, we can just move the loop brackets like so. So let's go a step back. And let's talk about the warp markers, because normally you can warp audio using these yellow markers, the warp markers. Now let's make another one here in the middle and move this one slightly to the left. You'll notice then that in this part, the audio will play back faster, and in this part, the audio will play back more slowly. However, we didn't notice any change in the video yet, and that is because we have to apply these changes by saving the clip right here. So once I hit save, you'll see that the video indeed does speed up and slow down. But what if we want to use multiple videos at once? How do we organize them and determine which are shown and which are not? Well, first let's drag in a second video. And once we hit play, both videos will be shown on screen. Now I can determine the visibility with the volume faders, or I can mute channels, and I can use the solo button if I want to solo one of the two channels. In addition, there is the crossfader here on the right, that I can use to assign these channels to. So this channel is already assigned to side A, and I can assign this one to B, and I can do this with as many channels as I like. And then I can use the crossfader down here to transition between the two different sides. There are more ways, however, to decide how different video channels add up, and for that we have to talk a little bit about blend modes. Tracks are blended in left to right order, so the leftmost track is overlaid with the track on its right side using the overlaying tracks blend mode. The result is overlaid then with the following track and so on and so on. So to really grasp what that will look like, we'll have to use one of VideoSync's devices named Properties and put it on the required channel. We can find VideoSync's plugins in the user library where the files were installed back when we were also installing the control surface. We'll skip right past the effects and the instruments, which we'll cover in a later video, and grab the effect and put it on both channels. So, the properties device will only affect settings of the channel it's on, and only one instance will work per channel. Right at the top we then find the blend modes. The default is additive, which simply adds all colors of underlying and overlaying images together, and the alpha blend mode, however, draws the overlaying image over the underlying images. Unless the overlaying video has an alpha channel which can determine what part of an underlying image is seen through the overlaying one, so the alpha channel is basically for transparency. So let's fool around with some of these videos and set both of these channels to alpha. And let's play the clips. And now we only see the channel that is here on the right. Now, if I lower the opacity, the left channel will show through. So if we want the left channel to be on top, we just have to move them around. And now the most right channel is this one, and that's the one we see on the screen. 
Now, what if we want to make our project a little bit more complex? Let's say if we were going to work with group channels and sends and stuff like that. How does that work? Well, basically the same as with audio. I can group these channels together. And now these two channels will be blended together and then being sent into the group. So the group is, again, its own channel that can have its own properties. So you can decide how this channel, the group, should then be blended with the overlaying and underlaying layers. Now let's grab one more video. And this time I'm going to take the hiccup tester and put it on the top layer. And I'm going to play this. Now this top layer doesn't have any properties yet. And that means that this channel is still in the additive blend mode. Now this video, it's just a white line moving across the screen, actually has a black background. It's not transparent, but because it's additive, only the bright pixels will be added to the existing signal, not the dark one. So that's why we don't see the black background. However, if we go to the user library and then put properties on top and set it to alpha, now we see that this is the top layer and all of the other ones are not shown anymore, but I can use the volume fader again to bring it up. Now let's turn this one off. And what about send and return channels? Well, just like audio, I can use these sends to feed video signals into return channels and apply video effects to them. We will look more into this in another video. The last thing that's very typical for live to use is racks. So let's say an audio effect rack. We can create multiple chains which are basically layers. So the top chain, that's this one right now. And this is the underlying image. So I can put video effects on these different chains. So I basically duplicate the chain and I can do so as many times as I like and put different effects on all these different chains. And those will all be added together again based off the properties and the blend mode. To conclude this video, I want to show you a few more things in the preferences of VideoSync, and we can find those on whichever machine is running VideoSync. So in this case, that's my iMac. And if we go to the preferences and then on the general tab, the first thing we encounter is the status item. Now that's this thing here in the top right corner of our screen that is displaying the FPS counter that we can show or hide, or we can show and hide the icon entirely. Then next, we can let it check for updates automatically and we can send usage data to ShowSync. Now on the second tab, we already know the bottom part of the screen, but if we want to record the output from VideoSync into another app that can receive Siphon, then all we have to do is enable this checkbox. Then lastly, in the preferences screen, we have the license tab, which is where you can fill in your license key or you can deactivate it. Now, if we go to the status icon here in the top right, we have a few more extra options. And first of all, there's the X, Y axis to show us where the video is on our screen. And then below that are the dimensions of the window. So if I move this, as you can see, the numbers will change as well. And if need be, you can fill in numbers here manually. Then we can decide if we always want to show this window on top. Now, this would go over the preferences window, but it never goes over this window. So ultimately this one is on top. Then we can decide if we want to show the border or not. So if I hover over it with my mouse, now there is no border and now there is. Link the master fader. So the Ableton Live master fader only controls audio by default, but if you also wanted to control the master output of video sync, then you can link it here if you want to. And moving on to rendering, then here is the draw size. So if we actually want to render a lower resolution than the screen we're running video sync on, then we can set a different draw size here, or we can set it as the same as the window size. Then we can set a target frame rate. So if 60 FPS is a bit too much and you're looking for a more steady frame rate on a low end computer, then perhaps set the frame rate to 30 FPS. Then there's the performance tab. And here it just shows you uh, how many frames there are per second on average and what the minimum and maximum frame times are. Then lastly, there is the console, which currently isn't showing anything. But when you, for example, connect video sync to another computer, then it will confirm the connection here. And that's it. So now that we know how to install and use the basic functions of VideoSync, we've come to the end of this first tutorial. In the next videos, I'll be covering all of VideoSync's instruments and effects, so be sure to check out those as well. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me in the comments and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.